Welcome. Thank you. Oh, boy. Thanks. This is, this is huge. And if you were here last year, it's a little bit nicer, right, this place? We have been, we've been handing out um, Stack Overflow stickers. I got a few more. If you didn't uh, get them, this should be enough. Um, and since this place is so beautiful, what I ask is that you take an extra sticker and put it somewhere on this convention center <laughs> for the purpose of, because um, they're very fancy. Also, the, um, there's a nice opera house, I understand, in Vienna, and I don't think it has enough Stack Overflow stickers. Um, does anybody, yeah, I, I, the, I asked this last year, and I promise not to repeat any jokes. Um, does anybody use Stack Overflow? Nope, wait. Don't answer that. Let's move on to the next joke. Um, Stack Overflow is now, Stack Overflow is now approximately 10 years old. Um, in September it will be the 10th anniversary of the launching of Stack Overflow. Thank you. And um, so 10 years, that would be, everybody's like, oh, that's like 70 dog years, which I don't know why they care how many dog years it is. Um, we measure the years of Stack Overflow and how many times we helped somebody get out of the Vim editor. And so we are now at 1.5 million times that somebody has viewed the question, how do I exit Vim on Stack Overflow, which is almost our most popular question. Uh, and you know, like, the, how do I exit Emacs? It's not even on, on there, because I guess you don't end up in Emacs by mistake. Uh, the, <laughs> the site was, I started, um, so I'll tell like, a little bit of history, and I just want to tell stories today. I'm just going to recount stories. Um, the site was founded 10 years ago. Um, the two co-founders were me and Jeff Atwood. And Jeff Atwood, you may know, is a famous blogger. His website is called Coding Horror, so he is coding horror, and he did the coding. And so I guess that makes me idea horror. Um, I had the horrible idea. And the horrible idea, I think, was probably to have Jeff Atwood do the coding. But anyway, <laughs> it was, um, it was uh, fine. His code was fine. It's OK. Some of it is still running uh, many, many years later. Um, was, wasn't that bad. But, uh, we didn't really know how big uh, Stack Overflow was and how awesome it was going to be and how huge. And um, very, very shortly after um, Stack Overflow came out, we already saw you know, the web logs and the Google Analytics and the numbers were, were going up. And um, we seemed to have uh, tons of users and it was going up. And my blog used to get 30,000 visitors a day. And Stack Overflow got those same 30,000 people on the first day. But then it was 60,000 the next day and 90,000 the next day. And a few months in, um, we got a call from Microsoft, and they were very excited because we were using ASP.NET MVC um, uniquely uh, among <laughs> all developers with websites. And so they invited us to a conference that they were um, hosting uh, in Las Vegas uh, to actually come up on stage and talk about our experience building Stack Overflow. And we thought, OK, how bad could that be? I've spoken in front of audiences with tens of people. It, it really couldn't be that that bad. And when we got there, we were, first of all, surprised that it, Las Vegas is really, really big. And the hotel where this conference was being held was the Venetian. And this hotel, like, this is the kind of hotel that other hotels stay at when they go on vacation. <laughs> That's how big it was. Um, and it was a room, it was actually, it, it was bigger than this. There were 5,000 people in the room, and I was sort of standing there backstage looking out and saying, oh my God, I don't know what is going to happen. I'm going to, all those people are going to kill me just by, by looking at me because there's so many of them. Um, so before we went on stage, I said to Jeff, you know, I read this technique you should do, which is I'm going to ask the audience how many people here have heard of Stack Overflow or use Stack Overflow. And Jeff said, you, you, you cannot do that. That's so, it's going to be so embarrassing. Nobody's going to raise their hand. Joel, I will kill you. That will be mortifying. You're going to get four people in that entire audience. You're going to get one. You're going to get minus, do you want two minus seven people to raise their hands <laughs> when you ask that question? Um, but we did, we did go out on stage, and it was indeed um, terrifying. And it was just, you know, the ballroom was the size of Ireland, I think. That's my calculation. <laughs> Um, and uh, I asked the question, like, hey, how many of you use Stack Overflow? And, like, Jeff looks at me and he's like, gives me this sort of death stare. Um, but it was pretty good. It was like maybe one out of three people um, raised their hands. Um, and, you know, as I like to say, that was the last time I was ever able to ask that question because now people just laugh. They don't, they don't raise their hands. <laughs> They're like, ha, ha. Like, 
Oh, how many people use gravity? <laughs> I, <laughs> I want to ask a slightly different question today. Thanks. Use the stickers. Michael, I actually kind of want to ask a slightly different question here, uh, which is um, how many uh, people in this room, if you have ever answered a Stack Overflow question, could you stand up for a minute if you have ever answered a question on Stack Overflow? Okay, so that's insane. And let's have a round of applause, actually, for the, the, this is actually probably more people that had ever even seen Stack Overflow. Um, and that's really where um, all the value comes from is answering those questions. It's uh, 100,000 people a month come and answer a question. That's more people than edit um, pages in, in Wikipedia. So uh, it's uh, absolutely ridiculous. Um, every one of you who has answered a single question, that question on average helps about 1,000 people. That's our calculation. 1,000 people later find that on Google, and it helps them and saves them time. And we have sort of a formula. It just It's not page views. It's actually... Um, less than that. That's the, the number of people that you've helped. Do a quick calculation, like when you solve somebody's problem with an answer on Stack Overflow, how much time do you save when you find the answer on Stack Overflow? Well, let's just guesstimate half an hour. Um, a thousand questions, like 500 hours that you have saved for the world for every single question that you asked. And that's um, really um, kind, of, kind of amazing. It makes the world um, you know, that much uh, better for all those hours that are saved, which those people are now using to upload cat videos to Reddit. Uh, to play Fortnite, Pokemon Go, et cetera. So it's really making the world better. I, our number one, um, every, I can't, I'm not allowed to talk about Stack Overflow without mentioning our number one user. People are like, who's your number? It's John Skeet, of course. Um, quick story about John Skeet. Number one, he has answered 36,447 questions on Stack Overflow. Um, so that's a lot of questions. The, those questions have helped, by our calculation, 230 million people. So it's not that many people. There's probably only 20, 20 million professional developers in the world. So on average, if you're a developer, John Skeet has personally helped you 11 times when you've, when you've landed. <laughs> um, and that's every single person in the room. And so that's saved every single developer on the planet Earth. Let's just guesstimate five hours, six hours, or something like that. In, in other words, he has single-handedly propelled the world five hours into the future of where it would be had he not answered all those questions. And that's actually, actually uh, really kind of shocking. I have some other interesting facts about John Skeet. Somebody asked me um, at, at the talk this morning, a few of you uh, might have been there when I did the fireside chat this morning, and somebody asked, uh, does John Skeet ever get a Stack Overflow <laughs> in his code? And uh, of course he doesn't because he doesn't program in C. But uh, the real... Um, I, I am told, actually, that John Skeet can divide by zero. That's how good he is. <laughs> I was um, once flying. I went to the Norwegian Developers Conference in Oslo. And um, I was on the same flight with John Skeet. And when we landed at the airport, if you've ever been to Oslo, you know, I, um, it's a, like a really long um, moving walkway from the airplane to immigration. And I'm standing next to John Skeet. And he's doing this little mental calculation. And he's like, OK. And he pulls his laptop out of his bag and opens it up while on the moving walk, while sliding along the moving walkway. And he logs onto the Google VPN. He's an engineer at Google. And I notice that he's got Visual Studio up on the screen. <laughs> like, John, what are you doing? He's like, I have time to fix a bug here. And by the time, <laughs> I was like, OK. Uh, by the time we got off, he had fixed a bug relating to time zones in Saudi Arabia. Uh, within the 45 seconds by the time we got off, he's like, good. He checks it in, closes his laptop, puts it back, and then steps off the moving walkway. Now, I don't know about you. I have never even coded standing up, let alone on a moving walkway with a laptop uh, in, in my hand. So uh, that is pretty cool. The next, um, next question I always get about Stack Overflow is uh, whether um, the idea of Stack Overflow is really unique to software developers. Could we make like Stack Overflow for heart surgeons or physicians or something? I had, by the way, I had um, heart surgery last year. Um, I'm fine, thank you for asking. <laughs> and, um, and so the first question is, what would you call Stack Overflow for heart surgeons, of course, if they had one? I do, uh, the two ideas I came up with were cardiac overflow or maybe cardiacarrest.com or Maybe you want to use an insider word, so it's like a myocardialinfarction.com or something. Um, 
But I mean, can you imagine if a heart surgeon is in the middle of surgery and they're just kind of like digging away and they're like, could you? <laughs> I guess they, they wouldn't use the laptop for sanitary reasons. They would probably have a nurse um, standing there with the laptop and they could say, what, what is this little flappy thing <laughs> over there next to the left ventricle? And the nurse would, you know, type and be like, um, yeah, that's the mitral valve. All right. Does he need it? And this is exactly, um, now see, unlike um, surgeons, uh, we in the software development fields do not even pretend to have the remotest idea as to what it is that we're doing. We just dive in, we would roll up our sleeves if we had any, um, and we start coding, as they say, with hammers and anger until, um, and stack overflow, until uh, we get, we're going, we don't pretend to read the documentation. I have never read documentation, I haven't read documentation for 10 years. Has anybody ever read a book or, any? no, of course not. It's just ridiculous. Um, um, I never do, and, and I, actually one of the reasons you don't read the books, of course, is because they drive you crazy because the information in them is not the information that you need when you read, the te whether it's documentation or an O'Reilly book, it's never the information you need at the, at the right time. I think of like, it always tells you everything except the one thing that you wanted to know, right? So. You get out the book, and then you, maybe you want to create a node project for the first time. So you get the node book from whatever, and you open the documentation, and there's a whole bunch of like legal disclaimers and warranties, and, and it says, oh, okay, how to create a node project. All right, how, creating a node project. Step one, make sure your computer is on. Okay, that was good. If your computer is asleep, wake it up. Some computers distinguish between sleeping and hibernating. Okay, step two, oh great, okay. Ensure that the computer is in front of you and that your hands are above the keyboard. Again, if you don't have hands, see Appendix 2.4. <laughs> Appendix 2.4 is not available in North Korea, Libya, Canada, or Syria. I mean, <laughs> okay, somebody put that in there for a reason. Okay, really just trying to create a node project. Step three, step four, step seven. Create the node project. And then that's when you realize that the people that wrote the documentation don't know any more than you do <laughs> about the subject. And it's sort of like, you know, like a 15-year-old child in school, and he's told, you know, write an essay about the Cold War. Well, the Cold War was uh, very important. It was much more important to Europe than the warm war or the hot war because the temperature was lower. Yes, full credit. Um, why, why is documentation failing? I mean, the, written, the official written documentation fails because uh, as a person who's supposed to write it and doesn't know the answers and is afraid to go talk to the developer, the, um, a lot of the documentation you have to write, all right? So you've created a new uh, framework or a class library or you've just put up a bunch of new servers and you want to explain to your teammates how they work and so you want to document that. And there's sort of the tr traditional way of doing that lately I've heard a lot of is like, oh, we have a wiki. Go write your documentation in the wiki. And so you go sit down at the wiki, and now you have a homework assignment, which you don't want to do. And not only that, you don't really know what to document and when to stop and how much detail to go into. So you either write not enough documentation or too much documentation. It's very, very hard to know when to stop. And in fact, it feels good to stop writing documentation, and nobody's going to call you out on it. So you just stop uh, usually too soon, but if you've written too much, which is what I used to do, uh, it's also very frustrating to know that nobody ever reads it. You never get any feedback as to whether the documentation is helpful. And um, indeed, that was one of the things you saw with kind of one of our failed projects at Stack Overflow. Um, and some of you may remember that we launched this thing, uh, I don't remember when, I'm trying to forget myself, called Stack Overflow Documentation. And it's like, hey, as developers, why don't we rewrite all the world's technical documentation? That sounds fun. And it, it's just very hard to get motivated and you don't really know what people need and what people want to see documented. Um, and so that project turned out to be um, uh, wrong. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, but, but really the, the, the real answer is questions and answers, all right? Questions and answers is, is you could, you start by writing maybe an FAQ where you write some questions about your own stuff and then you answer them yourself. And then as people ask additional questions, you write answers. And um, if you're doing this on Stack Overflow, then you're getting the little checkbox 
uh, from the person who asked uh, the question saying, yeah, you answered my question, and now you know to stop. You don't have to write anymore. And if you don't get the checkbox, you have to keep helping them until you do finally help them, and then you can stop. So not only are you creating this amazing just-in-time documentation, but you're creating the exact right amount of documentation, and that's really uh, the way to do it. So this, is, this was our idea. Is this is a, a way to do it better. And uh, we had had some experience with big companies who used Stack Overflow Enterprise, which is a licensed version of Stack Overflow that you run in-house. So companies like Microsoft have something internal at stackoverflow.microsoft.com internally. Um, where they ask internal questions, and we wanted to make this available to the world because we thought this would solve the documentation problem better than the documentation thing, and that is Stack Overflow Teams. So that launched uh, about two weeks ago, and you can, if you haven't heard of this yet, you can go to stackoverflow.com, you can make a team for your teammates, and then you can kind of answer questions um, privately there. And one of the, um, so let me segue a little bit to one of the nice advantages of Stack Overflow Teams, I think, is that uh, when Stack Overflow was small, uh -huh, for one day, it, it was um, okay to ask questions there, but now the idea of asking a question on a big public site with a million people in the world is uh, scary. It's a little bit scary to ask a question with so many people uh, looking at it, and uh, most people are disinclined, uh, let's say, um, to ask those questions. Stack Overflow can be an unwelcoming place um, it can be a little bit scary, and, it, and sometimes people are mean. And in fact, that is a generally, <laughs> generally true problem of the internet. And it doesn't mean it's not also our problem. But um, don't, you know, as I say, don't read the comments. Like, really, if anybody types anything on the internet, probably don't, don't read that. <laughs> the, I have a friend, really, everything that you post, anything that you put out there into the world is just like an invitation for people to throw tomatoes at, at you and, and, and be mean. Um, I was very careful. I did not have comments on my blog posts back when I was writing a lot of blog posts in Dolan Software. I have learned to not read the Twitter. I don't really care what the people are saying on the internet because um, people are mean. I had, a, I had a friend. He worked with me at Fog Creek and he discovered that the people were mean on the App Store. When the, when the iPhone App Store first came out, the very first version, he wrote a little app. Uh, it was cute. His app was called Ruler Phone and here's how it worked. You took out a credit card with the camera of your iPhone. You took a picture of the credit card in front of something that you wanted to measure. And because all credit cards are the same size, it could do a little multiplication. It could tell you how big that thing was based on the size of the credit card. So it was pretty neat. And he was having fun with his app. And people were downloading it. It was a dollar. And they were paying the dollar. And so he was making like, I don't know, $1,000 a month, um, plus whatever he could charge on the credit cards. And um, <laughs> but the. The reviews that he got on the App Store were just so ridiculous and, and, and infuriating. Um, so uh, there were there were things like, uh, I don't have a credit card. It's like, okay. Or, uh, one star, I didn't use it. Um, that was the review. Um, also, this is the worst game ever. <laughs> Which, we laugh, we had a big... Big, big laugh about that. And ever since then, when I have some spare time, I go on the app store and I like review things. Like I go to the Uber app and it's like, oh yeah, this game is terrible. I couldn't get past level one. Couldn't figure out how to kill the little cars. <laughs> you can have a lot of fun with that one. Um, so, uh, so there's sort of a similar, uh, similar problem on Stack Overflow, honestly. And uh, the... The, if you're a new person to programming and somebody told you, hey, you got a programming question? Oh, well, we just go to stackoverflow.com. You can ask it there. You are very likely to encounter trouble <laughs> the first time uh, you do that because there's people uh, that have to answer the questions as opposed to robots, and I don't even know if the robots would be so good. So I want to tell, how much time do I have? I want to tell a couple stories about debugging and all that kind of stuff, but you'll see it's all going to add up to uh, a real point um, that I want to make here. Let's talk about um, two kinds of debugging. Has anybody heard of rubber duck debugging? I'll, I'll explain this if you haven't heard. It's a great idea. Here's what rubber duck debugging is, and this is like pro every programmer should know this. What you do is you get a rubber ducky, you know, from the bathtub, and you explain to the rubber ducky what your code is supposed to be doing in great detail. Uh, people look at you strange, but. Um, and you say, this is supposed to do that, and this is how I think this is going to work, and you know, this, this, I, this is supposed to do this, and it's not. It's doing this other thing. 
And then, um, through magic, the rubber duck comes to life and you cook it and eat it. Uh, no, wait. Through magic, a lot of times, you will actually explain to yourself what you thought was wrong. And um, people have reported that just act explaining, it could be to a colleague, but why waste their time? Just get uh, like a rubber toy, a snake. It can be a rubber snake, not a real snake. Um, you could explain it to my puppy, who is so dumb that he doesn't know where he's supposed to poop. Uh, and you may still get the benefit of, um, of actually fig figuring out um, what was wrong with your code, and that's called rubber duck debugging. So here's another, that's debugging technique number one. Debugging technique number two is divide and conquer. And that is the technique where you have a thousand lines of code and something is not working and you don't know where it is. And you could scrutinize 1,000 lines of code, but that would take a year. So what you do is you put a printf in the middle of your lines of code and you divide it in half and you try to see is it is a problem up here or down there and then you narrow it down to 500 lines of code and then you do that again and you do that again and those of you know that know about logarithms know that, that you will very quickly narrow it down to the single line of code that does not do what you expected. And at that point, you might say, boo, or you would at least look up the documentation for that method call um, and possibly even solve your problem. So one of the reasons these are relevant to Stack Overflow is these are things that you can do instead of going to Stack Overflow and asking a question, um, which is fine, fine by me. I do not need the, the, the page views. Uh, John Skeet, um, remember John Skeet from the first joke? He, um, he has a blog post, which is amazing, and it's called Writing the Perfect Question um, on Stack Overflow. And so if you Google Writing the Perfect Question, um, you'll find this post. Uh, Here's a couple of things that he wrote. Uh, absolutely the number one thing. Have you read the whole question to yourself carefully to make sure it makes sense and contains enough information for somebody coming to it without any of the context that you already know? Okay, so what is that? That's just rubber ducking, right? Like it's just saying, hey, go through this rubber duck stage before you hit post on your question on Stack Overflow. Here's the second thing he wrote. He said, if your program contains code, have you written it as a short but complete program? And the short part, that's the divide and conquer, right? Because the last thing we want is for people to post a thousand lines of code on, on Stack Overflow. We want them to say, why doesn't this one line do this thing that I thought it was supposed to do? It does this other thing instead. And that's really, really easy to answer. And when you think about um, these particular, and essentially what John Skeet is saying, he's under the guise of trying to tell people how to ask the perfect question. He knows that he's actually gonna solve 90% of their problems even before the question gets posted. And that's um, the real idea here, and that's um, kind of the real value. And that's sort of essentially the Stack Overflow community saying to the world, uh, we want to help you with your programming problem, but could you please do these few things, because we have found that these things uh, will, will make it easier, and that's why those are our rules. And some people find these rules to be weird or unwelcoming. Um, Wah, I don't like your rules. You have dumb rules. These are not my favorite rules. Uh, this is going against free speech. <laughs> this is sort of the number one, like the number one theorem of the internet is that most people think that they have an inalienable right to type words into the internet and then those words will just always be there uh, until the heat death of the universe. That is anything else is not free speech. I can type anything I want. Um, but the rules, I mean, the rules are there for a reason. You just don't understand them. <laughs> that's okay, and that happens all the time. Has anybody heard of the Burning Man Festival? They have a lot of rules. This is a festival, I guess. It's sort of a camping experience. It's an art festival um, out in the desert. It's super, super hot. It's held at the last week of August when it's unbelievably hot in the desert in Nevada in the middle of absolutely nowhere, and there's absolutely nothing there, and you have to bring in every single thing you need, water, food, tent, shelter, I don't know, doctors, if you plan to get sick, because um, there's nothing there. And w one of the weird rules of Burning, Burning Man is also a gigantic festival. There are 70,000 people go there every year, and they build this temporary city in the desert with stuff that they brought in. And then when they leave, they scrub the entire desert clean, and they do not leave behind you know, a single grain of mustard seed, um, because it's, it's, uh, it's got to be that clean. And um, that's, that's the rule of Burning Man, and one of the rules of Burning Man essentially says, listen, we're not providing water for you, but also any water that you bring in, and I don't know, you use it to wash your face or to brush your teeth, you cannot leave it on the desert. You can't just 
dump it out because that will poison the desert and make things grow where they didn't grow before. And who knows why, but you can't, you have to carry out every piece of water you brought with you into the desert in a can or bottle or jerry can, checked luggage if, if necessary, like it was a cherished relic, even though it's just the, what you spit out after you brush your teeth. Um, and that's the rule. And so what do people say about this rule? 70,000 people, there are a lot of people who think they're smarter than that rule. They're like, eh, this is a dumb rule. I'm smarter than the 70,000 people that have been going here for 20 years. I have a better idea. Let's just scatter the water in the desert and it will evaporate. Um, but it doesn't, it turns to mud and it, it destroys the desert and so you're not allowed to do that. But also, who cares whether that's a good idea or a bad idea? That is the rule. The Bureau of Land Management, which owns this land, has decreed that Burning Man will not be allowed to come back and keep happening if people pour out their water. They gotta take the water out and they check that and they inspect that and that's why the, that's the rule. And if you don't like that rule, you can fucking go to Coachella Okay, so a lot of people don't understand the rule. They think it's a desert. The water's going to evaporate. Stack Overflow has similar rules, and everybody comes, and they're like, nah, I am smarter than all you guys. I got a better idea for what the rules should be. One of the rules, I'll just give you a pick one random example. One of the rules of Stack Overflow is you can't ask a question that the correct answer would be an entire book because that's sort of too much to ask. It's not nice. You do get questions. How do I program or how do I make a program that, you know, whatever. And uh, if, the, if the correct answer, and I don't know anything about programming, but I heard you guys are really good at it. And that, like, to me, if we had the heart surgeon uh, website, that would be like, you know, how do I perform a septic ablation? And I have never, I'm not a doctor, and I have never really operated before, but, I mean, how hard could it be? Can I do it on myself? Do I have to... And then, what's the only answer you give that person? Go to medical school. Sheesh. Um, and then you see this, you, you will see literally the same thing on Stack Overflow. Um, oh, to answer your question, um, go get a computer science degree, please. And it feels unfriendly, and it really, it really kind of is. Uh, and that's not really the, um, the, the, the impression that, that, that we want to go. And similarly, what happens is well-meaning people like John Skeet write these well-meaning documents saying, you know, could you please make sure that you have explained it to a rubber duck and that you've got the minimum amount of code that demonstrates your problem. And nobody's got time for that, and nobody wants to read that, and they're like, you know, whatever, it's the internet, I'll just type something. Will happen. And then, you know, and people come in and say, look, you didn't follow the rules, you just pasted up too much code, your dog is ugly, and you're probably bad smelling, I can't tell through the internet, but let's assume. And then those people hate us, uh, justifiably, actually. And uh, one of the things that we're actually doing when we do that on Stack Overflow, or sort of the lack of kindness about the way which we communicate the rules on Stack Overflow, is that we're driving people out of the field. And I don't, they don't have to be too subtle and look around at the demographics of the audience at this conference, and you will notice that there is somebody, there are a lot of people missing um, from the field of being programmers. Um, and a lot of times, uh, the people that are missing from the field of programmers are missing because they tried and somebody was not nice or made, gave them the feeling that they were anything less than, than welcome. Um, and that can be really tough. And so we've got to figure out um, a middle ground of being kinder to people uh, while uh, also um, helping educate them about why we have the rules that we have and why we do things the way that we do. Essentially, I mean, one important thing to remember is that the the, the great secret of Burning Man is that we want to leave no trace behind. We want to leave no garbage. The great secret of Stack Overflow is that we're not here to answer your question that you typed. We're here to provide a question and answer that will help a thousand people that come from Google later. And once you understand that, you realize, aha, these, a bunch of rules are constructed in such a way that my question should be formatted and so forth, and it should be written in a way that it could possibly help loads and loads of people. And so the way we describe this at Stack Overflow is that the mission is the artifact, the thing that we leave behind um, is actually what we're, what we're out here to do. And so a lot of people work on the assumption of saying, we got to keep that artifact pure and clean. And anybody that puts anything into the artifact that is not going to help a million people and that is not carefully formulated and it's just a stupid homework problem that, that we've already seen seven times because seven other people in their class already asked it, those people will be you know, burned at the stake and stomped out and made to go away, and they will. 
Um, but eventually they'll learn to be programmers. And then they will not come back and they will not contribute to Stack Overflow. So if you want to take the short term, the sort of a short term approach to let's keep Stack Overflow you know, clean uh, and, and work on the artifact. But there's a much more important long term approach, which is let's get as many people as we can into this field. And when they get in, I want them to feel like Stack Overflow helped them and was a warm and welcoming place. So they have an obligation to give back and help the next generation of people. Um, so we don't just become you know, just a crabby old um, place like Wikipedia. Sorry, I, not Wikipedia, sorry, a, a thing like Wikipedia. Um, anyway, Wikipedia has also created an amazing artifact, but the number of people that contribute to Wikipedia keeps going down, and it's actually very scary, and it's a very, very unwelcoming place um, to make contributions, um, if you've ever tried. Uh, time, skip that, sorry, I just had really good jokes on it. <sighs> I'll do, I'll do one of them, which is um, we do, uh, I'll talk about one more uh, rule that we have on Stack Overflow, which is an interesting one, and we've got to start reconsidering this right now, and I'm not, um, I'm kind of going to open the debate. Um, early on, the idea of Stack Overflow was an upvote um, is what powers Stack Overflow. If somebody writes a, an answer that's very valuable, and you see it, give it an upvote, because first of all, that helps the engine, so it knows to show this to people. Um, and secondly, it's a little way of saying thank you to the person who asked the question. And it says thank you in a nice way where they get reputation that they can carry around with them and show everybody and helps them get jobs and whatever. And uh, like that is the Stack Overflow currency. It's like here's my thank you to you is that I, I upvoted this. And it was very important for us to teach people to upvote. And so in the early days we said please stop saying thank you. Just upvote. You don't have to say, the thank you is not helpful. It's not a good artifact. It's just noise to the person who comes from Google and wants to read the answers. But the upvote is very helpful because seeing this answer got 54 upvotes, much more valuable than a page full of thank yous and whatever. So that was um, well-intentioned, and I think it did a lot of what it accomplished in terms of teaching people about the upvotes. But what happens is that people still come and they still write thank you. Or when they write their question, they still write, I wondered if anybody could help me with this, please. And so far, so good. The problem is a bunch of people remember, oh, wait a minute, we don't do polite on Stack Overflow. And they have edit privileges, so they hit the edit button and then they delete the word thank you. And now you're sitting there saying, wow, that person really helped me. I'm going to upvote them and I'm going to give them the check mark and I'm going to find out their employer and write a nice letter. And I'm also going to write thank you on this website. And then some dick on Stack Overflow comes along and deletes your thank you. And you don't know about this rule from 10 years ago and encouraging the upvotes. What do you know? That your thank you got deleted. So it's sort of an example of uh, uh, a policy that might have made sense, and we have not successfully educated the entire universe about why we don't say Stack Overflow on thank you. And even if we had, they don't agree with us that thank yous are bad. So we don't need the thank yous, but my proposal is let's stop deleting the thank yous. I mean, if it's an answer, delete it. But if it's a comment, leave it. It's fine. It's fine. It doesn't hurt. That's my proposal. Shut up. Now, people are wasting time. Let me, uh, yes, 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 water machine. OK. Last year, um, if those of you that were here last year, um, which is probably less than all of you, uh, because it was like 3,000 people, and now there's 8,000 people, so that's amazing, because this conference is great. Um, what I talked about a little bit is how what developers do is they're writing the script for the future. That was, I believe, the title. And by that I mean you're writing code. That code is going to run in the future, so it will actually define something that happens in the future. But um, it really is kind of amazing how much the stuff that we're working on, it may be small, it may be large, is really going to impact the world. All, those of you that answered questions here have now saved thousands of hours. John Skeet has personally moved us five hours forward into the future. Um, but you know, every time you write, <laughs> here's one. Here's a, a website that I went to this morning, which I have decided is now the world's worst website uh, for today. For today, Here's what happened on this website. Um, I'm not going to name the airline that made this website. I'm just going to make up an imaginary name of an airline because I don't want to shame anybody in public. So my imaginary name for this airline with their website is going to be Cathay Pacific. And... They, uh, they had a drop down with a country. It was like, where's your passport from or something? And I'm looking for United States of America, and it's not there. And so this is, Americans will sympathize with this. So now I'm looking for USA, which is in a different, 
alphabetical order, and it's not there. And I'm like, how can that be? Now, sometimes they put USA at the top because we're number one. So I'm looking at the top, and it's got like China, Hong Kong, you know, things that they care about at uh, uh, Cafe Pacific. The, um, I just searched for an hour. Eventually, I found American. They had sorted it under American. All right? So now, if I did that, everybody else is doing that too. Everybody else is wasting time and being a little bit infuriated. Some person went through the list of countries and like translated them all to the adjectives. And like they had to look them up. Like, what's a person from Cameroon? You know, like they had to figure out is it Cameroonian? Cameroonian? Camer. Sorry. That somebody spent hours writing the script of the future, which is infuriating. And, uh, and, and there's a lot of stuff that you can do that's delightful, that's actually kind of wonderful um, when you write the script for the future. And some of the things are small and some of the things are big, but that's what we're doing as developers. Now, if we're going to do this with a room full of white 21 to 27 year old men, that's gonna be a different future, I think, than if we can do it with a more a diverse audience. And as we uh, create the code for the future, this stuff is running in parallel to laws. It is a legislature in some ways. The decisions that Facebook makes about what things show up to whom are probably more important than laws that governments actually pass. Governments sort of struggle uh, to catch up um, with, with Facebook. It, it, it's legislation, it's the future, it's defining the future, democracy is really important, and everybody has to understand that participation is what makes democracy work. It can't just be like Roman-style democracy. Um, it has to be everybody, and so the, the demographics are really important. So. Um, uh, my really goal for the year and sort of what I want to see um, um, for Stack Overflow uh, over, over the next year is um, to try to improve as, as much as we possibly can, try to improve the uh, inclusiveness of this field and try to get more people into the field. And I think that what we need to look at really, really closely is, you know, in what ways our, our behaviors on Stack Overflow, maybe just being snarky, it's, if you tell somebody on Stack Overflow, oh, that's easy, they ask a question, and you write your answer and you say, oh, that's easy, dot, 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 dot. You may not realize this, but a lot of people read that's easy as you're dumb. They shouldn't. You might just be happy that you can answer an easy question, but they may read this as, if you think this is easy, I am not prepared to be a programmer, I can never be a programmer. And so merely writing that's easy in an answer is going to, reduce participation on Stack Overflow and in the, in the programmer's world. And those are things that nobody even thinks about. Like, uh, uh, you know, is it really so bad? It's not, it's, not an it's not aggressive to say that's easy. There's nothing, there's nothing, I can't point to anything wrong with that other than the fact that some percentage of people are going to feel less than welcome in the field of programming. And maybe it was easy, you know, but there's, there are nice ways to say that. Um, so, in conclusion, all right, this is year four of We Are Developers. I was here for number three and four. It's actually getting kind of amazing. Like I said, there are 8,000 people here from 70 countries. You had Steve Wozniak come and give a talk. Um, that sounds really cool. I have a Woz story, I will tell you. He told me this in person, and I have not found evidence of this yet, but there are tweets where people have taken photographs. He printed up a bunch of stickers, and the stickers say, do not flush over cities, and he puts them when he goes on a plane above the toilet in the bathroom, above the toilet, on the plane. He's got these stickers printed up. They say like Boeing on them, really small, printed on metal. And it just says, do not flush over cities. And I just imagine Steve Wozniak sitting there laughing to himself about people going in, <laughs> going into the left. And they're like, how am I supposed to know? Wait, is that how it works? I thought that was delightful. So. Next year, by the way, if you come to year five, we're not gonna have these stickers, we're gonna have Do Not Flush Over Cities, stolen from Steve. Um, that, um, he's um, absolutely delightful. But um, the l last thing I wanna say is sometime between now and when you come back next year, um, you know, think of a way to try to help new developers and to bring them into the fold. I think, um, as you saw here, the number of people that really wanna help, um, the number of people that want to uh, make a contribution by answering questions, um, is huge. You, you, you all kind of want to help, and there's sort of a lot of things you can do. Answering a question on Stack Overflow can be a great help. Helping somebody uh, figure out how to ask a question on Stack Overflow. 
Uh, not even answering a question, but just go find a newbie. We have a newbie queue. You can go find questions that are being asked by somebody that's never been to Stack Overflow before and go dive in there and just be nice and welcoming to them. If you look at some of the smaller Stack Exchange communities, you'll see a lot of that. There are communities in the Stack Exchange network where the first question that anybody posts will always get a comment saying, hey, welcome to um, you know, Judaism.stackoverflow or whatever it may be. There's a lot of, um, a lot of ways you can do that to really um, help people help out with interns in your company, boot camps, um, teaching coding, um, write a blog, help people learn how to code. Um, that kind of stuff can be uh, really uh, beneficial. Come back to this conference and give a talk. Um, those are all things you can do, but let's try to figure out, since I have this kind of audience here, let's try to figure out some way over the next year we can just be a little bit more welcoming and we can take that, you know, whatever, that, that tiny amount of effort spread by, multiplied by uh, the millions of people that visit Stack Overflow all the time and make programming look like a more welcoming and, and more inclusive uh, place that everybody is uh, happy to join, welcome to join, and it's hard, it's hard, but we'll help you. Thank you very much. <laughs>